traditionally, um, the BDS, uh, so Serena and Irvina, Lori, and various other people have been working on the BDS stuff. I, I don't know who. Uh, and we, we have a lot of contributions. Cheryl brought in a bunch of stuff uh, that she contributed. So if you want to to find out what needs to be done so you can help with BDS, uh, there's a sign-up sheet in the foyer, and you can also reach out uh, to Serena if you need to call my number, um, and I'll get you in contact with Serena and Erlene on what needs to be done in regards to that. And we need guys, too. It's not just girls. Because yeah. we need, like, sawing and drilling and all that. So, tools. So, guys, sign up. So, uh, it's uh, the Rocky Railroad. Uh, there's a theme, and uh, and Jesus uh, gives us power uh, is the uh, sub theme on that, uh, or is the actual theme of that. Uh, also, I'd like to take time on now to recognize any birthdays this week. Do we have any birthdays that we're celebrating? Birthdays?
thank you for all that you've given us. And as we uh, studied in the book of Job, that everything that we have, you have given us. And Lord, we pray that this time, as we worship you in tithes and offering, that you will receive a worship as we return to you a portion of all that you've given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We're starting a preaching series through the book of 1 Corinthians, and it's going to cover some basic Christianity, you know, our, our Christianity 101. What are the basic things that, uh, in, in behaviors and thought and, and such, that we look at when we look at Christianity? So, so with that being said, my first, uh, then my question to you is, do you like people? Now, the extroverts in the room are going to be going, oh, yeah, I love people. I love going, you know, and I love being around people. And, you know, they just, they can't, when, when they've been shut in, they, they've been going crazy, right? They've been going on the wall. The extroverts understand. I enjoyed the shut-in stuff, you know, because I didn't have to be around people, you know. <laughs> and, and so uh, you have that. But when you get around people, are you know, what would be the words that people would use to describe how you treat other people? What would be a, an example of something that, that would, you know, be said about you and how you relate to others? And, and when we come to uh, this idea of how we treat people, how we look at, e- at each other, how, you know, we interact with them, we have to look and recognize in our society today, there's a lot of divisiveness. There's a lot of things going on, and you can be uh, judged on your beliefs, on, on your, uh, your, the way you work, or the, your ethics. You can be judged on how you relate to people and, and how you see those. And all of these can, can result in a variety of accusations and stuff where, where you're being accused of things that are, aren't necessarily true about you. And, it's, and it's a, it creates an atmosphere of divisiveness. And if you don't believe a certain way then you can certainly be ostracized by many of those in society. That happens in this whole cancel culture, they call it today, that happens all the time. And and we see that, and and that is now infecting our churches. Divisiveness can come in and infect our churches. In the book of Corinth, the town of Corinth was a, it's a town that's on a kind of a narrow strip of land, if you would, that's between Greece proper and the peninsula of um, the Peloponnesian uh, group, the Peloponnesian Peninsula, and, and there's that little strip of land that that connects the two, and there's the uh, Sea of Crete on one side, and I forget what the name of the other is, uh, the gulf that's in there on the other, but the ships would come in and dock on one side, and the cargo could be transported across the land instead of the ship having to sail all the way around and coming back. They could just transfer our, our trans, uh, <coughs> transfer the car- cargo uh, across the land and get it to the other dock. And, and so it became a, a necessary uh, port, if you would, in Rome. Now, Rome destroyed it. A, a couple of hundred years B.C. and about 50 or 60 years B.C. they decided, they realized the importance of it and they decided to, to build it back up and reestablish. So what, what Rome would do is they would take and they would take some of their citizens, a lot of them were retired military, and they would take them and they would establish them as the citizens in a particular city. And those people would begin to, you know, grow and populate and so on. And so you had this mixed culture of Roman citizens and then the Greeks that still lived in the area and all of these people in the ship trade industry that, that would come into there. And so Corinth became a hotbed of many different cultures, many different cultures. And, and in Rome, 
they were very acceptable. It was, it was understood that you would have many gods. So polytheism or the worship of many gods uh, is a, was a practice. And, and to, in Rome, if you only worshipped one god like the Christians, you were an atheist. So, so this is the idea, and, and within those practices, in, within those religious practices, and within the citizenship, you know, the, those who were citizens, and in those different cultures, there would be groups formed, and then it was a constant battle for who had the most prestige, who had the most power, who were the most recognized. So people would align themselves with those groups in order to become, to align themselves with powerful people. And, and that was a normal way of doing things in Rome. We, we would see this uh, in different ways uh, in our society. Uh, you know, whether it's Republican, Democrat, or whether it was rich and poor, uh, there's just a whole lot of different ways we could align ourselves with people in order to attain power, so to speak, and, and become what we would consider important. Well, just like I was saying earlier, that mindset to infect the church. And so in Corinth, there were these house churches, and that, those were the churches that met, met pretty regularly, and then ever so often they would come together, about once a month they would come together and meet as an entire congregation. Well, you can only imagine that with the house, house churches, it was probably the house, a larger house of, of the more wealthy people that, that they met, and so the people began, began to form alliances with those in, within those house churches, and then when they came together, there was this disunity and this, you know, hey, I'm, you know, I, I go to church, you know, I go to Gaius' church. You know, I go to Stephanus' church. Oh me, I go to Apollo's church. And you could see, and, and there was this division and this struggle that, that brought disunity and disharmony within the church. And within that, because this was also, this wasn't just them being divisive, this was also them bringing the world into the church. So, so as part of the loyalty that these citizens of Rome would show the emperor, they would become part of the imperial cult which worshipped the emperor. We might call that the state. They worshipped the state. Whatever the emperor said, that was the ruling thought, you know, and, and they would practice that. So, so a lot of this began to take place, and what we see is in Corinth, Paul is writing to address this divisiveness that is taking place and people jockeying for political power. We certainly see this in churches today. Right? We see power groups form, social groups form, and, and people uh, of all different kinds, and, and they, they go and, and they start to rip apart and pull apart at one another, and, and instead of loving each other, they end up tearing each other down. So in Corinth... Paul addresses how we treat people in 1 Corinthians. Turn with me, if you would, into 1 Corinthians, and we're going to read from verse 1 uh, out of the first chapter in verse 1 through verse 17. Stand with me, if you would, and honor the reading of God's Word. 1 Corinthians 1, verses 1 through 17. It says, Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and 
and Sosthenes, our brother, to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints with all those in every place, with all who in every place call on the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus, that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you, now I say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, or I am of pa Apollos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of was Paul crucified for you, or you baptized in the name of Paul. I think my God that I baptized you except Christmas and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I have I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanas. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any other. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. Let us pray. Father, I pray that as we worship you in message, that you open and our hearts and minds and you prepare us to receive the message that we that we have, and that, that you would cause us in this message to see others in the way that you see us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So one of the things that we see is that Paul begins to address this, this uh, church in, in Corinth, and he calls them the church of God. So, so first, in order for us to figure out how to treat people, we have to, we have to understand the identity of the church. And the identity of the church is that the church is set apart, right? It's a set apart as God's people. When he, the word sanctified, and holy or saints, it's all from the same word, the base root word, holy, which means set apart. We are those who are set apart by God. Now sanctified has, has a, has a, like a current status versus a growth status. In, in other words, I have been set apart by God, I have been sanctified by God, and I am sanctified in Christ, or sanctified by Christ, and I am sanctified in Christ, I am set apart by Christ, and I am growing in Christ. So there's those two there's those two ideas of the word sanctity, and there's this idea of saints, which means we are set apart. We are specifically set apart as God's people. Our affiliation, the number one affiliation, is that we belong to God. In our study today, Job at the end, when he had lost everything, he says, Naked I came into this world and naked I leave. He had lost thousands of animals and livestock, thousands of possessions. He lost his entire kids. He had ten kids. He lost all of them. And he saw them as something that was given to him by God. Our salvation is what joins us because we are unified together in Christ. We belong to Christ. And because we belong to Christ, we are all equally set apart by God. There's not one who is more saintlier than the other one. 
Each and every person that, that's in this building, each and every church member that, that exists outside of this building, all need to be saved by grace through faith. There's not a one of us that God is sitting there going, Woo-hoo-hoo, I'm glad he's on my team. You see, we all needed that salvation and we are all set apart and we belong to God. We belong to sin and death. Now we belong to God in whom is life. So when we look at each other, we have to say, hey, you know what? That's someone that God saved. And the second thing here underneath this in our identity we have to see is that we are set apart to serve God's purposes. We're not here on this earth to serve our purposes. If God was through with us, we would no longer be here. But because we are set apart for God's purposes, we're still here. And as long as we're here, we are to serve Him in whatever way and however He wants us to serve Him. Can you imagine your house just saying, Hey, I'm no longer going to be your house. And it gets up on its imaginary legs and just walks away and goes somewhere else. You go, hey, no, I I own you, house. Come back here. Or your car, now your car, you know, but (laughs) your car saying, hey, I'm going to drive away. I I don't want to belong to you anymore. No. These things exist for our purposes. Same thing. We are God's possession. We, you know, these are, these are things that a lot of times we don't like to look at because we want to we wanna put a gate and a fence around God and how God can think about us. But in all reality, God owns us and we belong to Him and it's His purposes that we serve. So there's no one here that serves a greater purpose than the other purpose. We all equally serve God's purposes. And we are to embody, we are to set apart our lives to be godly. We are to embrace the things that God has for us to embrace. It's not just the stopping of the bad things that we do, it's embracing those things that God wants us to do. And we see that in the fruit of the Spirit and patience, and long-suffering, and and love, and kindness, and meekness, and gentleness. It's in those things that we are to, we're supposed to allow to flow through our lives. And, and the last thing that identifies us is that we are set apart as a holy community for God. God never says, I'm saving you so you can go off and be by yourself and be a church unto yourself. God brings us together and it's, it's, it would be like this part of my finger saying, you know what, I'm going to go off and be something on my own. There's that old joke that that God is is dishing out responsibility and he and he tells the the big toe, you know, hey, you're gonna be a big toe. And the big toe says, Oh, I want to be an eye. And he says, No, you're gonna be a big toe. Oh, come on, I don't want to be a big toe. I want to be an eye. And God finally says, Okay, you're gonna be an eye, but you're gonna be looking at a sock all the time. So, <laughs> so so there's this idea here is that <clears throat> is that we are a holy community and we all fit together to serve God's purpose in the communities that are around us. We, we are 
made so that each of us has a purpose in this church and when we fulfill that purpose, that's how we serve the community around us. And it's in, you know, not everybody's, not everybody is doing Awanas. But we have prayer warriors who are always praying for Awanas. And praying, you know, not only for the kids and for the workers. And I tell you what, you know, we, we've had enough salvations and stuff to come through to say, hey, you know, God's hand is on that. Not everybody is meant to be a Sunday school teacher. But we have pray, people praying for Sunday school. Not everybody is meant to be up here preaching at the same time. It would be interesting to watch, but not everybody is meant to do that. And, and because of that, people are praying for the worship services or the music, you know, the, the praise service and, and all that. So pe- we have people praying. We have people who give and support financially, and some can do so way more than others can. And, and we have all of these gifts that we have and, and we serve God in those gifts and it is an entire community that we have. And, and I want us to understand something. When we go to heaven, it's the, it's the people who believe in Christ we're going to be in heaven with. And, and I love my family and, and all that. Don't get me wrong. Don't take this wrong. But those family members of mine that are not believers, I will not be spending eternity in heaven with. It's the people sitting in these pews. It's the people sitting in the pews in other churches. Those who have received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And then the other way that we define the church is our of the church. You see, Paul was Paul was hopeful, and in this sense, it was more of the wishful thinking kind of hopeful for the church. He he said in verse three, "Grace and peace to you." Grace, God's grace, is how we start our relationship, and His peace is how our relationship is culminated. So, so by grace, by God's unmerited favor, by our, by we, when we don't deserve it, God saves us by grace, and by grace we continue and we, and we live through the struggles in life and, and all of that, but it is in that relationship, that ongoing relationship, as I seek to do the things that bring honor and glory to God and seek to put off the things that, that dishonor God, those are the things that ultimately bring me peace in my life. So that when I face the struggles in life, I can know that God is still God. God is still God. That the end of time has not come, so to speak, you know, for for my family or, or my life. But God is still in charge and He's still in control, even though our circumstances may be extreme. Paul also had a thankful, he had an attitude of gratitude. Man, are you happy because of the people, are you happy that the people who are sitting on the pews are sitting here in the Thank God for you. He prayed about these churches and he would write to them and he says, every time I lift up prayers, I thank God for for you. And and his thankfulness for Corinth is is in the fact that and, and we'll see they didn't necessarily apply the knowledge but but they had the intellect in place. Theologically they were right on. In practice they were off, but what they knew the, what they knew intellectually was right on. And what they had in the way of gifts, they did their best to exercise those. They were just...
their gifts and they were exercising and he was saying, man, your gifts and, and your knowledge, I'm so thankful for the way that you have, for these things that you have. And, and he begins to, to, to challenge us here. It, it's a challenge for us to say, am I thankful for the people that are here? Which begs the question, what people would you not be thankful for? You see, is there anyone that you would not be thankful for being in here? It's the idea... That we are a group that belongs to God and we want to praise God for each and every soul that comes here and gets saved and, and is a member of this church or a member of the churches wherever they are. We want to be thankful for those individuals that praise God. His grace was manifest in their life through their salvation and their faith in Jesus Christ. Thank God. Thank God for the people that serve Him. Thank God. Thank God for those who put Him number one in life. Thank God. And then he looked at the expectation. Right? He, he said, man, I expect you're going to be blameless before God. When the end time comes, I expect that you will be blameless in the day of the Lord. Man, you know, each of us, I'm going to tell you, you know, it, it's, it's like we, we see, you know, we have these young kids here, and we have some of us that are, you know, <clears throat> not as young as young kids, right? And, uh, and we realize that this is, this is a, you know, we, and we hope that this is a faith that continues to go on from generation to generation to generation, that this church will have a purpose and have meaning from generation to generation to generation. But our expectation is, is when Christ comes on His second coming, when the rapture of the church occurs, that all who believe on His name will be captured and taken up and all will stand in front of Him and He will claim each and every one who, who He has called and who He has saved. That each of us who have called on the name of the Lord shall be identified and our name will be written into the Lamb's book of life and our sins will have been forgiven and not held against us. Why? Because we have unity with Christ. We have the identity of the church, the attitude of the church, and lastly, we have the reputation of the church. You see, the church had began to have divisions and to exercise these um, political you know, differences and, and align themselves with leaders. And, and Paul was addressing that and he says, you know what? We are, we all have to be unified in thought, or in other words, in doctrine. Now, you know what? Today, that's one of the words that a lot of people are trying to shun, but in 2 Timothy, he says, hey, Paul writes to Timothy and he says, hey, beware of the last, of the end times, because people will start looking for doctrine, right? It basically doctrine that fits them as opposed to the doctrine that God is laying down. And doctrine is nothing more than God's truth. It's the teachings of the Word of God. But it's a word that is used in the Scripture and we ought not be afraid of that word. Because just like sanctification, it's a word we should become familiar with and we should understand. And us being on the same, of the same mind and same accord in our understanding of truth is necessary for the unity of the church. In other words, we believe 
that there is one Christ and one Christ only. That that Christ is divine. He is the Son of God. And, and as the Son of God, He came and took on humanity. That in His incarnation, He's fully God and fully man. If that's not the Jesus that you know of, then you are, then your doctrine is incorrect and you are, as 1 John says, an antichrist. And you are an antichrist. If you don't believe that Jesus came in the flesh, you are an antichrist. He was not apologetic. He was not soft. He did not delude it. He is otherwise. In other words, he is saying, you are an enemy of the cross if you're preaching any other Jesus than that Jesus right there. We are united in focus. As a church, we, be, we take God's Word and we receive God's Word and we learn and we are changed by God's Word. We see that as a focal point and as a focus of our lives. It's important for us to be knowledgeable of the Scriptures and, and to apply that information to our lives. That's what I like about this study that we're doing, <clears throat> that we're working through in this workbook. It's, it's showing how our emotions are tied to our beliefs and, and, ha and our actions, and, and it's laying this out for us so that we can address issues like anger or covetousness or depression and, and such. And it's a biblical view of these emotional things that we go through, and praise God that someone has put together this so that we can more easily understand it and study it. It's kind Kind of tough to read at times, but it's it's a good study. And we use that and we are transformed in our lives and we accomplish God's work through that information as we decide, hey, you know what? I believe this. So so this, whatever it is I believe, is going to become a principle and a core value of my life. And I believe that I belong to God and that He has set me aside for a purpose and that He has set you aside for the purpose, then how I relate to you should be impacted when I say this is going to be a principle and core value of my life because you are equally important, you are equally value, valuable in God's eyes just like any other, anybody else. Jesus died on the cross for you just like He died on the cross for everyone else. There is none that are more important. As a matter of fact, the Bible teaches us to look at others as better than ourselves. And to put others' needs first. Isn't that what Jesus did? When He died on the cross... In all reality, it didn't make him more God. It didn't make him more the Son of God. It didn't add to him one single thing. What it did is it was a way that he could pour out his love on his creation whom he loves dearly. And when we face the struggles in life, one of those teachings that we ought to have Christ died on the cross for you and for me. He was demonstrating the extent of His love. And then we ought to take that and realize that's the answer our society needs. The gospel is not a closet bunch of information. The gospel should be in our language. The, the, biblical, the doctrines of the, of the Bible should be in our language. It should be in our actions. It should be in our thoughts. So that as we interact and we speak to people, and as people look upon us, you know what they should hear and what they should see? The gospel of Jesus Christ. The gospel of Jesus Christ. What did God hold back 
for you. Nothing. Why should we, who received everything from Him, hold back anything on His behalf? We look at the identity of the church, the attitude of the church, and the reputation of the church. And in this we begin to see that how we treat each other is how we relate to Jesus Christ. If my relationship is impaired or is in any, one being, in any way by being hindered by either my laziness and not studying or not praying or in my carnality and my practicing sin and partaking in sin, then my relationship on how I treat others is going to be impacted. The way that we grow and the way that we represent to our community that Jesus is real is how we treat others. Jesus said they will know you by your love for one another. They began to tear each other down. And that's real easy for us to do. It's in our nature. What did Adam and Eve do? The first thing Adam did is, that woman you gave me. Right? <laughs> He's, you know, backing away. Package, minimize, and distance. It wasn't me. It's you and her. <clears throat> right? And what does she do? That serpent. You know, it's easy for us to blame others and to point the finger at others. We're not, we're not called, you know, entirely to point. Now, there is an idea that we do judge ourselves and we help others. Okay, that's, that's one thing. But we are called to bring honor and glory to God in the way we live. And he says, if you do, the way you do that is reflected in how you treat one another. If you can't love people, you certainly can't love me. So today, I, wanna, I want you to think, is there someone that I have something against? Someone I need to make things right with. Is there someone that I need to apologize to? And if there is, then we need to take care of that. And if they're here, you can take care of that today. Maybe there are some of you who are lost and without Christ and you don't have the relationship with Jesus Christ. The Bible says if you will repent, that means instead of running from God, you turn from your sin and to God and put your faith in Jesus Christ because He died for us on the cross so that we would have, so, and He took all of our sin and guilt so that we would have forgiveness of sins and right standing with God and have a renewed relationship or a, or a relationship with God, we, we understand that if we put our faith and we receive that, that we will be saved. And right now we're about, as Serena comes forward, we're going to have a time, an invitation time where you can make whatever decision it is you want, whether you want to... Whether you, uh, to get saved, or you want to make things right with someone, maybe you decide this is a church that I want to be a part of, I want to be an active member in, and I want to join your church. And, and so whatever the case is, we encourage you to make that decision. Uh, as the Holy Spirit leads during this time, I'm going to ask you to stand and we're going to pray. Father, I pray that you be with us during this time. May your Spirit convict us of sin and of righteousness. And may we be obedient to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.